The Fichet 666 is an uncommon French high security lock that was originally patented in 1964. The exact mechanism of action and its elements are not very well understood or described. The original patent claims that due to the arrangement of its elements, picking the lock would require two hooks to be used simultaneously and their opposing actions would cancel each other out. While this is clearly not a true statement, the locking mechanism is nonetheless ingenious and complex, which makes the 666 incredibly pick resistant. There are seven sliders in the lock, four on the top and three on the bottom. Each slider has one true gate and no false gates. When all the sliders are in the correct position, either by the insertion of a key or by successful picking, the gates will all line up and the sidebar can retract into the gates. The complexity of this lock lies in its unique sidebar mechanism. Let's take a closer look at this. In order to understand the sidebar mechanism of the 666, we should first review the function of a sidebar. The sidebar mechanism in most slider, wafer, or lever locks is pretty straightforward. Let's look at the Miwa U9 as an example. The sidebar performs two functions. It's used both to authenticate the gates and serve as a blocking element that prevents the lock from rotating. When the gates in the Miwa U9 line up, the sidebar authenticates that they are aligned by being able to drop into the recess. This same action of retracting into the gates withdraws it from the groove in the housing and allows the core to rotate. In contrast, the Fichet 666 has three sidebars, which each have their own separate yet interlinked function. First, the authenticating sidebar. Next, the blocking sidebar. And finally, the coupling sidebar. The sidebars are connected by two saddle pieces. Let's assemble the sidebars into the lock so that we can understand how they are arranged and connected. The core of the lock has two grooves which run the length of the lock. One of these grooves is where the true gates will align. This is where the authenticating sidebar is placed. It could either be in the top groove or the bottom groove. In this particular lock, the authenticating groove is the bottom one. The other groove is where the coupling sidebar is placed. Next, the saddle pieces are placed on both ends of the sidebars. The blocking sidebar then sits atop the saddle pieces. When the gates of the sliders line up in the authenticating groove, the authenticating sidebar may retract into its gates. The blocking sidebar is then rocked towards the authenticating sidebar. This allows the blocking sidebar to disengage from the groove in the housing and allows the core to rotate. Well then, what's the purpose of the other sidebar? This is where the magic happens. The second internal sidebar is a coupling sidebar. It gets some of the tension which is placed on the lock distributed to it. It acts as a secondary contact point that interacts with all of the sliders as it rests against the flat portion of the sliders. This causes two things to occur. First, the true gates do not bind as strongly to the authenticating sidebar, so feedback is dampened. Second, as one slider is moved, it can have an effect in slightly shifting the position of another slider and indirectly affecting its binding. This leads to the characteristic picking property of needing to tap each slider multiple times to get them properly aligned. After the main pick of this video, there will be some bonus content in which I detail the experiments that I ran, which illustrates these differences. Let's take a look at the sliders now. Each slider has one true gate, an area where the key or pick interacts with the slider, and a central cutout, which both acts as a channel for the key and houses a spring. There are four sliders that need to be pushed up, and three that need to be pushed down. If the lock is using the bottom groove as the authenticating groove, these would be all of the slider types. On the top row are the nine possible slider types that would need to be pushed up, and on the bottom row are the nine possible slider types that would need to be pushed down. Sliders in the left column are the no lift sliders, and sliders on the right column are the max lift ones. If the top groove is used as the authenticating groove, the same sliders are used, but flipped upside down. The sliders on the left column are now max lift, and on the right are the no lift. The 666 has a W-shaped keyway, 
much like the Miwa U9 or the Ingersoll. With these types of keyways, the best area for tension wrench placement would be the periphery, as it gives the most room for you to pick. Fichet definitely considered this when making the 666, and deliberately constructed their lock so that tensioning from the periphery would not be possible. This is accomplished by extending the keyway into the housing of the lock. The housing has cutouts which allows entry of the key. The key in turn has a narrowing of the blade next to the bow such that it will not engage with the cutouts of the housing. Tensioning from the periphery is futile as it would just transmit the tension to the stationary housing. Therefore, the best position to tension would be towards the center with the shortened bottom of the keyway tensioner. This positioning makes picking more difficult as it limits the room to pick. With clockwise tension on the core, the force placed on the blocking sidebar would be coming more from above. This would apply more force to the bottom sidebar. Therefore, if the authenticating groove is located on the bottom, clockwise tension is preferred because it imparts more tension onto the bottom sidebar. If the authenticating groove and sidebar are on the top, counterclockwise tension would be preferred. The take home message here is that if tensioning in one direction is not working, try tensioning in the other direction. One direction will be easier due to the mechanics of the sidebar. Okay, let's get to picking. So the odd numbered sliders one, three, five, and seven are on the top and the even ones two, four, and six are gonna be on the bottom. What I want you to notice during this pick is how moving one slider may affect the position of another one and how little auditory feedback there will be. This is the effect of the coupling sidebar. I'm going to be using a shortened bottom of the keyway tensioner with clockwise tension and a number one Peterson short hook. Okay, so seven is loose, five is binding a hair, seven's not doing anything. Let's try the bottom. That's six, nothing. Five, seven is binding, five is binding a bit, seven is back up. Six is now binding, but not doing much. Going back up, five and now one, three, five, seven. Five is now binding a bit, that's one. And that sound means that everything just kind of fell back down. Back to six, try and get six. Seven is now binding, five, one, three, six is binding, now to two, six again, back to two, now that's binding, going back to the top, five, seven, three, one, six, and we're open, nice. All right, let's get this fiche out of the vise. So this is the monoblock format. It actually has to be cut in half, uh, which is destructive. And that's why a lot of people haven't gutted this thing. So I'm gonna lock it back up, push the core out of the back of the housing. And we're gonna drop the blocking sidebar as well as all the other pieces. These are the two grooves, the sliders the other side of the sliders, and the front of the lock. Next, I'm gonna show the internal sidebar, which is either the authenticating or coupling sidebar. This is the other sidebar. They're physically the same, but have different roles depending on which groove they sit in. I'm gonna arrange everything nicely. The blocking sidebar is in the center, the saddle pieces are on the top, and the internal sidebars are on the side. Oh, you still around? Okay, good, I got some more stuff for you. According to the original patent, the dual internal sidebars were used for a mastering system, where one sidebar would be used for the master keys and the other for the regular or change keys. This would be accomplished by using sliders with two true gates. When using regular or unmastered sliders, the second internal sidebar would remain in place. This is what I have called the coupling sidebar. To figure out the effect of the coupling sidebar in an unmastered lock, I cut up the coupling sidebar so that it no longer touches the sliders. 
It did, however, prop up the saddle to allow normal function of the authenticating and blocking sidebars. In this experiment, the sliders would bind much harder, they would snap into place once lifted to their true gates, and would not influence or reset the other sliders when manipulated. This validates our claim that the coupling sidebar both dampens feedback and couples the sliders. Let's take a look at these different properties in this next pick. So this is the same exact lock that you just saw me pick. All the sliders are exactly the same. The only difference is that the coupling sidebar has been cut and disabled. This lock is gonna behave very nicely. No dropping sliders, great tactile and auditory feedback. I'm setting slider seven and it just nicely stays there. Six, four, and two, not binding. I'm now checking uh, number one and number three. Nice click out of two. Now I'm checking number five, three, and one. I'm gonna go down to two. I'm gonna push that down, but it feels pretty set. So I'm gonna go back up to number five. Now that's binding pretty hard. Beautiful click. Back to three, one, and then going back down. Six is binding really hard. And we're open, nice. So as you can see, that pick was completely different. And it is in fact the coupling sidebar that is responsible for all the beautiful and complex picking properties of the 666. Anyways, let's get this one open. And all what's left to show you is how I've cut up this coupling sidebar in this experiment. As you can see, the saddle pieces are in their correct position and all the sliders are exposed in the second groove and there is no interacting with the coupling sidebar. Anyways, I hope that you enjoyed this pick and learned something. And if you did, please subscribe and I'll see you at the next video.